Hello, I'm Ellen Stofan, the John and Adrian Mars Director of the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum. Joining me is Steve Monfort, the John and Adrian Mars Director of the Smithsonian's National Zoo and Conservation Biology Institute. Steve, both of our organizations care deeply about understanding and protecting our planet Earth. Yes, Ellen, and one of the most critical issues threatening our planet, of course, is climate change. You know, as scientists, we see evidence of climate change everywhere in, in our warming atmosphere, our oceans, and on land. And in previous videos, we've discussed the series of satellites maintained by NASA's Landsat program that help us to keep a record of how the physical landscape of the Earth is changing. But how can satellites help us understand what we can't see, like levels of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere? Monitoring greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide is of critical importance to understanding climate change and meteorologists and atmospheric scientists at NASA are doing just that. Hello everyone, my name is Carlos del Castillo and I am a NASA scientist. And I am here today talking with my great colleague, Leslie Ott, who is also a NASA scientist working at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Um, Leslie, could you please tell us a little bit about the type of research work that you do? Sure. Thanks, Carlos. Um, I'm a so by training, I'm a meteorologist, um, and a lot of people think that just means predicting the weather, predicting where big storms go. But most of my time is spent actually tracking uh, air pollution and uh, the sources and emissions of greenhouse gases. Um, and we have to have a really good understanding of weather to be able to understand how all those things are moving through the atmosphere all the time. So what, what type of new and exciting research questions have you been trying to address using these fantastic tools that NASA has, like satellites and airplanes? It's a good question. And, you know, sometimes the research questions are kind of classics, and that just means that they're, they've been hard and they're hanging around a long time. One thing we're still working really, really hard on is trying to understand um, where carbon dioxide, the most important greenhouse gas controlled by people, um, how that enters the atmosphere and where it goes. Um, so we know that about half of human emissions of carbon dioxide end up staying in the atmosphere long term. About the, the other half is absorbed by uh, the ocean and by the land, which is great. That's a really important mitigation of climate change. One of the challenges though, is we still don't understand exactly how that carbon dioxide is flowing between the atmosphere, the land and the ocean. So most of our work is trying to stitch together all of these different satellite data sets to solve this missing uh, puzzle of, of where the carbon is coming from and going to. So one of the neat things about the type of work that we do, I think, is that we, we don't only use satellites and airplanes, but we, we also go to the field and, and do work in the laboratory. How, how do you mesh all these things together in, in your work and how it helps you fill in information gaps you might have? You know, it's funny, so certain satellite data sets we've had going back to the 70s. So you think of something like Landsat that gives us, you know, a really detailed picture of the landscape and how that's changed over time. Ocean color is something you work on. We've had different data sets for that going back a number of years. Satellite measurements of carbon dioxide, we've only had from NASA since 2014. It's a really difficult technical measurement to make. And it's a great achievement that we finally have these measurements, but even though we, we have them and they're giving us the most complete coverage that we've ever had in seeing carbon dioxide from a global perspective, there's still a lot of gaps. For example, the satellites can't see uh, during winter in the, the Northern hemisphere or the high latitudes because uh, it's dark and they need sunlight. So, so we're missing these really, really important ecosystems up north, which are dark for, for large parts of the year. Um, they also give us this integrated picture of how many molecules of carbon dioxide there are in the atmospheric column, but sometimes that's tough to relate to longer term measurements we have on the surface. So measurements that give us uh, better seasonal coverage in certain places, measurements that tell us how CO2 is flowing at different levels of the atmosphere are really, really critical. And those are things that we can't get from satellites at this point. So it actually takes people going out into the field and making those measurements is a lot of hard work. So you mentioned something interesting. Uh so you do work in the Arctic, and uh, and I have many friends in Florida. So if, if they ask me, what do I care, right? Uh, why sh should I care about measurements in the Arctic and, and people freezing, like samples over there? 
That's one thing people think a lot about the Arctic. It's far away, you know, who cares? It doesn't affect my, my life. It actually does, right? So that we're seeing really ch big changes uh, in the Arctic. That's the place that's changing more quickly than anywhere else on the planet. We're losing a lot of sea ice. Um, that's affecting ocean circulation, but actually affects weather patterns. It affects atmospheric circulation. So even people living, you know, in the middle of the United States, they're probably affected by change in the Arctic in ways that they don't understand. Um, the other thing that that can be really, really important is changes in Arctic ecosystems, right? That that affects their ability to absorb carbon. So if we have changes in um, the type of vegetation, if we have trees um, that are being burned by fires and then they grow back as shrubs, that affects the carbon balance of the whole planet. And so, you know, even though it might seem far away to us, when we study the planet, you and I, we, we look at it as this integrated system. And so we see all of these connections, the geographical connections, but also just the, the uh, subject matter connections of, of really being important for uh, carbon balance. You, you're trained as an oceanographer and as an atmospheric scientist, and you also understand, you know, land processes. So you, you have a very unique perspective. Um, so what, what do you think is, is the next thing? Well, it's a really good question. Even though we see all of these different places on the planet, there's still these kind of data voids that we really need more observations in, right? Um, and if something is hard for one satellite to observe, it's probably hard for multiple satellites to observe. So for the carbon cycle, one place that we would really like to understand better um, is the Amazon, right? It's very cloudy. That means it's really hard for our satellites to see when they fly over uh, in the in early afternoon. So right now we're working on building satellites that have have more opportunities to see during different times of the day. We think that's going to really help us understand some of the ecosystems that we don't see very well right now. Another thing that, that we're continually keeping tabs on is the Arctic, because like we mentioned, that's changing more rapidly. So that's, that's sort of the experiment of how climate change is progressing. So we need to keep track of that very, very closely through a combination of boots on the ground and satellites to really make sure we understand how climate change is progressing. And that teaches us really valuable lessons about what's going to happen in other places. Well, thank you, Leslie. This was fascinating. I really appreciate your time. Uh, Leslie Ott from NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. I'm Carlos Del Castillo, a NASA scientist from NASA Goddard. Uh, thank you for your time. Thanks, Carlos. But by itself, the study of the atmosphere from space doesn't give us a complete picture of climate change. Research on migrating birds, some of which travel thousands of miles, give us a unique perspective on our changing Earth. Birds equipped with tracking tags can serve as climate scientists with wings. Hi, I'm Francesca Cagnacci. I'm a movement ecologist studying terrestrial mammals at Fondazione Montmartre. And today, I have the pleasure of speaking to Autumn Lynn Harrison, who is the program manager of the Migratory Connectivity Project and a research scientist at the Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center. Autumn Lynn, welcome uh, today. We know that you study birds and there are no other animals on earth that we associate to freedom. Um, you have lived and worked as well in many places in the, in the world. So how studying birds and being an international scientist come together in your research today? Thank you so much, Fran. Um, yes, I am a research ecologist at the Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center. And that means that I um, st study migratory birds. I use advanced space technology to track their migrations across the planet. And that has led me to the places that birds nest and that they spend the winter. And I think of bird migration much like air in that birds circulate and flow across the entire earth. They connect land to sea to air. And even some birds nest in burrows, so even a little bit underground. So birds really connect all of us across the planet. And I, I like to think of their migrations much like pen pals that we share across international borders. Because birds can fly, one may think that they can go and stop anywhere and they do not suffer habitat fragmentation and other problems that we create to the planet as uh, land animals. Is this really true? 
they do have quite a bit of flexibility because they're um, so mobile and, and they can fly. But much like humans, um, they have preferences for, for where they nest and, and where they spend their time, where they go to eat. Um, they won't just eat anywhere. And so there's some amount of flexibility, but um, global change, especially from development and deforestation can limit the habitats avail available to birds. So while they have some flexibility, their preferences means that we can still affect them. You have previously studied a large marine vertebrates, if I'm not mistaken, but now some of the creatures that you study and tag are very small. Uh, but do we really learn something about the entire earth as you were describing before, by the small heap? creatures? Yes. Um, one thing I have learned now studying birds after previously working on elephant seals that weigh about a ton, um, they, they may be small, but they are mighty. And I have been working on a species called the Arctic tern, which weighs about the same as 20 American nickels but they make the longest migration of any animal in the world. So they are small, but they integrate habitats and resources across the entire planet in ways that even large mammals um, may not. And some of these birds can also, and especially tags that you deploy on them, can also tell us something about the atmosphere. Is that true? Yes, and um, I've got a lot of ideas about ways that birds can assist in um, the work of meteorologists and that they may become meteorologists themselves. A lot of the birds that I study are in the Arctic region, which is, of course, ice covered part of the year, difficult and expensive to access and to deploy um, advanced sensors. And so birds um, can carry a little tag. Uh, this is about the same size as a medicine pill, an Arctic tern, um, can carry this on their leg. And this tag has a sensor to measure sea surface temperature. So um, this is just one example of how they might serve as an oceanographer or a meteorologist, but maybe we could attach other sensors like carbon dioxide, for example, um, to really make use of their movements. So basically we learn about them and from them. And indeed bird migration has fascinated mankind for, I mean, since, since we know that, right? Um, and we have learned in the last decades about wintering grounds and, and breeding grounds, thanks also to um, ringing that we have been doing for over a century now. But what do we learn from these talks about? I mean, do you have a, a particular story to share about something that we learn and uh, what we still need to know. Yes, I have many stories, but one that um, one of my favorites is a story of a shorebird called the black-bellied plover. The male wears a tuxedo like James Bond, looks very dapper. And we now have tracked the shorebird um, with a tag that communicates with the satellite. This is the tag with the solar panel on top and an antenna and the little harness that we use to attach the tag to the bird. And we have a bird now that we've been following for six years. Um, 100 years ago, when we first started banding birds in North America to look at their connection, it opened the world of migration to us, but for this species, black-bellied plover, until 2014, we only had two connections between breeding and wintering areas. Only two bands had been recited across the Americas for this species. Now we have over 50 individuals that we have followed throughout the entire hemisphere. This bird comes back to the same nest site, maybe five, six years in a row, but then the rest of the year, it's flying over the Canadian prairies, stopping to refuel, to build up fat along the way. And then it may end up flying over a jaguar in Argentina before it finally lands on the beach. And so the only way we're able to understand those migrations and, and how they connect us around the world from this very small breeding site in the Arctic to Canada, Texas, Argentina is by tracking them from space. Yeah, this is absolutely amazing. Thank you so much, Autumn Lim, for being with us today. You really told us fascinating story and great perspectives on research that we would like to know even further in the future. Thank you, Fran.